Hope your work week is off to a good start. You're watching The Daily Report. It's Monday, January 17th here in Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. Authorities here have decided to lift vaccine pass requirements at a few venues. We have details in a bit after a check on the global COVID-19 tallies. I have Kwonsua standing by. So just start us off. Sonny, let's begin with the daily COVID-19 caseload here in Korea. 3,859 infections were tallied as of 12 a.m., which includes more than 3,500 domestic transmission and over 300 imported cases. Uh, meanwhile, the majority of imported cases are found to be the Omicron variant. Now, Gyeonggi-do province posted the highest number of daily cases this Monday at more than 1,400, followed by 790 in the capital Seoul and 242 in the city of Gwangju. Uh, also, 23 people have lost their lives in the past day. We'll take a closer look at the figure in a bit, but uh, on this graph, we do see that infections have dropped from the 4,000s in the past day. However, compared to last Monday, it is an on-week increase of COVID-19 infections. Now, meanwhile, we've got now 23 additional fatalities, which has raised the death toll in the country to 6,333. And the total number of infections in Korea has surpassed 696,000. And uh, for the first time in the more than 50 days, the number of patients that are in severe or critical condition has dropped to the 500s. Now, not many people got vaccinated on a Sunday, as usually the vaccination rates do drop on the weekend. But if we take a look at the number of people who got their additional dose, that is rising faster than the first and second shot. Now we've got 45.5% of the nation's population that have received that additional shot. Now let's move over to the figures abroad. There has been an increase in uh, more than 1.9 million new infections around the world in the span of 24 hours as of noon Korea time with more than 4,000 additional fatalities. On to some specific countries here. The U.S. is now seeing an average uh, daily caseload of around 800,000 uh, infections. And uh, meanwhile, India has posted close to 260,000 new infections. In the U.K., meanwhile, there's been a drop for the first time in uh, around a month. There there's been around 70,000 new infections. Uh, meanwhile, 7 million uh, cases in Argentina, which has made this milestone over the weekend. And Spain has hit 8 million cases uh, just over the weekend, whereas uh, Netherlands has surpassed the total caseload of South Africa this Monday as of noon Korea time. And uh, those are the general updates that I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny. Right, so well, thank you for now. As mentioned earlier, there have been slight changes to vaccine pass requirements here in the country, and I have Kim Yun Sung in the studio with details on that. Yun Sung, good to see you again. Thank you for having me, Sunny. Right, so do start us off with the latest on vaccine pass requirements. Right, so the South Korean government on Monday announced that vaccine passes will not be required at department stores and large supermarkets following a court injunction. First, let's take a listen to what the health minister said this morning. The spread has downsized compared to December when we first expanded vaccine passes. Considering prevention protocols and the public's reception of them, there seems to be a need to loosen the vaccine pass rules for low-risk facilities. These low-risk facilities also include museums, movie theaters, private academies and study rooms. But vaccine passes will continue to be enforced at music academies where students need to take off their masks to sing or play an instrument, for example. These changes will be enforced starting from Tuesday. However, vaccine pass requirements at cafes, restaurants and bars will remain in place. To sum up, around 11% of the venues that previously required vaccine passes will not be tied down to these rules anymore. The government is also planning to lighten the penalties for businesses that violate vaccine pass rules in light of their financial struggles. Right. And Yeon Seng, vac vaccine pass requirements at department stores and supermarkets only came into effect last week before the court intervened to suspend the measure altogether, right? Yes, exactly. So right before last weekend on Friday, this whole administrative court issued an order to suspend vaccine pass requirements at department stores and supermarkets. This is following an injunction request submitted by a group of more than 1,000 citizens last month as part of a lawsuit filed against the government. Vaccine pass requirements for minors that were due to be enforced starting in March 
have also been put on hold. This court's limited jurisdiction, however, means that the decision only applies to the city of Seoul. Nevertheless, the government has announced a lifting of these restrictions nationwide in light of the recent controversy. Health authorities, however, are planning to appeal the decision on vaccine passes for minors entering non-essential or non-educational facilities while they wait for a ruling on the main lawsuit, which is still ongoing. Right, and by minors, we mean those aged 12 to 17, of course. Exactly. Right, moving on, Yonsu, what's the latest with regard to the spread of Omicron here on the domestic front? Well, the share of Omicron have almost doubled, uh, more than doubled, actually, in the past week. According to health authorities this morning, Omicron cases made up almost 27% of domestic infections, more than double from the week before. They also make up almost 95% of the imported cases. Since Omicron could drive the infection rates back up, health authorities have extended their social distancing measures for another three weeks. Right, Yansing, they are holding these measures steady, but there are some changes, right? Tell exactly. So starting from this week, gatherings of six are now allowed. This is compared to the four person limit that we've had in the nation for the past four weeks. Authorities loosened the social gathering rules just a bit since business owners have been protesting against the strict COVID-19 curves that have affected their livelihoods. But due to the threat posed by Omicron, health authorities are treading lightly with these prevention measures. Other rules remain mostly intact, including business curfews. Eateries, bars, gyms, public, public baths will close by 9 p.m., while private academies, PC rooms, and kids' cafes can stay open until 10 at night. For mass gatherings and events, up to 49 people are allowed if there are unvaccinated people in the mix, and up to 299 people if everybody is vaccinated. These measures will stay in put, stay put until at least Seolnar, the Lunar New Year, when a lot of gatherings and cross-country travel are expected. Health authorities are also contemplating extra measures during Seolnar holiday to prevent any wide-scale outbreaks. Right, of course. Meanwhile, on the treatment front, Yonsei, what has been shared about the distribution of antiviral COVID-19 pills here in the country? Well, as you all may already know, uh, Pfizer's oral COVID-19 pills Paxlovid just arrived in the country last Thursday and rollouts began on Friday. Nine people who are being treated from home started taking the treatment on the very day that rollouts began. All these people are either seniors aged 65 and over or has weakened immunity. Uh, who have been prioritized to receive these pills. And so far, none of these recipients have reported any side effects. Health authorities also said on Saturday that most of these patients have shown visible improvement in their conditions. So let's hope that these pills that have been so often called game changers can help us turn a corner in our outbreak. Right, I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. All right, Yonsing, as always, thank you very much for the report and see you on Tuesday. Right, now, early on this Monday, authorities shared their stance on vaccine passes amid public controversy and some confusion saw with regard to where these vaccine passes are necessary and where they're not. Tell us more. Right, uh, the changing rules do lead to confusion for regular citizens, also with the latest easing, uh, leading to questions on the very need of the system. Now, let's start with a remark by an official, which may be just a renewal of the government's stance, but once it has stuck to. Vaccine passes are an important means for us in minimizing the number of infections and the scale of the outbreak in the event of a resurgence, before we can scale back vaccine pass requirements when the outbreak has stabilized. It is also a complementary tool that can be employed temporarily on short notice as a substitute for social distancing restrictions, which often lead to significant social and economic consequences. So to go into more details on why some venues have been put off the vaccine pass list and why now, the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters said the COVID-19 situation has improved compared to early December when the vaccine pass system had been expanded. In terms of daily infections, the number of patients in severe and critical condition have dropped from above 1,000 to the 500s, while the operation of ICU beds dropped from close to 80% to 30 
30 percent, along with oral treatments now becoming available. The adjustment to the vaccine pass at large supermarkets and department stores was also needed to address confusion that stemmed from different court rulings, officials said. The primary criteria the government mentioned in making their decision for specific venues was whether it was possible to have face masks on all the time. With that, the vaccine pass system will be lifted at 11.7% of uh, venues or 135,000 venues roughly. Now, one thing I also want to mention is, uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, Sunny, when back in late 2021, when we talked about the government's plan for 2022, they did actually mention that they are uh, predicting to gradually take venues off uh, the list that are subject to vaccine verification. Right. Now, so venues for private academic purpose, purposes, that is, are exempt from vaccine pass requirements, but there are some exceptions. Right. Uh, Yonsung actually did mention uh, some of these uh, venues uh, just uh, a while ago, but uh, let me just expand on that. The exclusion of facilities was based on whether masks can be worn at all times, so to prevent droplet transmissions, but at some uh, education venues, that's just impossible. So that is why academies or cram schools uh, where that's difficult to prevent won't be subject to liftings of the vaccine pass system, which are wind instrument, singing and acting academies. Officials note that although the general number of COVID-19 infections among teenagers who mainly use these facilities are down, they still make up more than a quarter of total cases. And if the Omicron variant becomes the dominant strain in the nation, this younger population will be at a greater risk due to comparably lower vaccination rates. Uh, compared to their adult counterparts. Right, and speaking about Omicron, so were there any further forecasts about the potential rampant spread of this variant here on the local front during the morning briefing? Well, Sonny, some experts say that can happen as early as uh, this weekend, and some say next week. So, uh, but what they are, are all uh, common about is that the tailored response against the Omicron variant will kick in as soon as it's needed. Uh, let's take a listen to Park Kyang, an official at the earlier government briefing. We set to issue a warning when the case so hits around the 5,000 threshold, and we're ready to immediately roll out the response measures we prepared in advance if that figure rises to the 7,000 mark. Keeping this in mind, at that point, we will also set the mandatory quarantine period for those who have tested positive for COVID-19 at seven days. Now, shortening that period, of course, is uh, because we are expecting a much higher number of cases would uh, also lead to much higher numbers of COVID-19 screenings. And uh, because of uh, more people having to get uh, tested, uh, there are uh, going to be alternatives for people to um, go to other places to get tested, for instance, at pediatric divisions, as well as ear, nose and throat clinics, because those uh, medical facilities have said uh, that they will be first in line to help in diagnosing uh, potential COVID-19 patients. Right. And so if Omicron accounts for 50% of the total caseload, is Korea expecting to witness perhaps a surge in severe cases? That is a good question, Sunny, but it is also very difficult to predict according to officials. Now, usually what we have been experiencing is when we see a surge in infections around two or three weeks later, the number of patients in severe or critical condition has surged as well. But uh, because the um, Omicron variant is said to have lighter symptoms than the Delta variant, officials are uh, cautiously hoping that we won't see the same, uh, the similar kind of increase we saw in the past. I see. All right. So as always, thank you very much for the update. I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you. In our headlines at this hour, North Korea fired two projectiles into the East Sea earlier on this Monday morning. The latest launch marks the country's fourth weapons test this month. Our defence correspondent Pei Eun-ji reports. South Korea's military says the North launched two projectiles that appear to be short-range ballistic missiles. The Joint Chiefs of Staff said in a text message to reporters that the projectiles were fired eastward from Sunan Airport in Pyongyang City. 
The military said it is closely monitoring the situation to be ready for any additional launches by the North. The Defense Ministry says South Korea and U.S. intelligence agencies are analyzing the latest move. This is the fourth launch this month, taking place just three days after the North fired the same type of missiles last Friday. The North reported that they were ballistic missiles launched from a train, marking the North's second known launch using a railway platform, following the first one last September. Seoul's military said its initial assessment showed that last Friday's missiles flew about 430 kilometers, at a maximum altitude of 36 kilometers. The North also launched missiles last Tuesday and on January 5th and claimed that both of those launches were a successful test of its hypersonic missiles. Hypersonic missiles are seen as a game changer because they are easier to maneuver and operate at high speeds, meaning they are harder to track and intercept. Last Tuesday's launch was conducted under the watch of its leader Kim Jong-un. Pyongyang is banned from developing or testing ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons under multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Pae eun Arirang News. Stay with North Korea-related news. Trade between Pyongyang and Beijing looks to resume. Insiders claim a freight train from the north that recently arrived at a Chinese border town will soon return to the regime with much-needed supplies. Han Songwoo has more. For the first time in two years, a North Korean freight train crossed the Friendship Bridge on the Amnok River on Sunday to enter the Chinese border city of Dandong in Liaoning province. The isolated regime has imposed strict virus prevention measures, including border closures and domestic travel curbs, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020. It's unclear whether the train, which departed from Shiniju, was carrying any cargo into China, but will reportedly be returning to North Korea on Monday, loaded with emergency supplies, and will continue to make the trip on a daily basis for the time being. Yonam News reports it's the first time during the pandemic that the regime has formally opened its land border with China, with one unnamed source from the South Korean government saying the train crossing marks the official resumption of trade between the two. South Korean officials had said late last year that the return of cross-border rail traffic could be a signal that restrictions are loosening. Reuters reports that according to the United Nations, some humanitarian aid is trickling into the regime, though key shipments like food remain blocked. Several supplies of nutritional and medical aid that arrived by sea entered after up to three months of quarantine at Nampo port, but there have been no previous confirmations of major shipments arriving by train. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News. In other news, President Moon Jae-in has agreed to a preliminary defense deal with the United Arab Emirates. The deal comes amid a visit aimed at promoting Korea's partnership with its Arab counterpart. Our Blue House correspondent Kim Min-ji files this report from Dubai. South Korea will sell mid-range surface-to-air missiles, also known as the Cheonggung-2, to the United Arab Emirates. The two sides signed an MOU following talks on Sunday between President Moon Jae-in and Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, UAE Prime Minister and ruler of Dubai. President Moon is in the UAE for a working visit, part of a week-long trip that will also take him to Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Although the specifics have yet to be disclosed, the deal is expected to be worth around 3.5 billion US dollars, the largest in the country's defense history. The UAE becomes the first importer of the missile, which is designed to intercept hostile missiles below an altitude of 40 kilometers. President Moon said he was happy to ink MOUs on mid- to long-term defense cooperation and defense technology cooperation, and the deal for Cheonggung-2 went smoothly. He also called for continued efforts so it leads to reciprocal cooperation like joint research and development, production within the UAE and joint entry into third markets. President Moon also called for interest from the UAE for South Korea's efforts to host the Expo 2030 in the southern city of Busan and asked Dubai to share its successful experience of hosting the Expo 2020. Before the talks, the South Korean leader visited the Expo to attend a ceremony for Korea Day to promote the country's bid. Dubai Expo is a very important part of the Expo in 2030. Busan Expo is a very important part of the Expo in 2030. 
주제로 삼았습니다 두바이 엑스포가 추구하는 목표와 맥을 같이 합니다 2030년 한국의 해양수도 부산에서 다시 만나 세계의 대전환이라는 담대한 항해에 함께하길 희망합니다 Earlier on Sunday, President Moon attended a business roundtable on hydrogen cooperation. As Seoul seeks to expand its horizon of energy cooperation with the oil-rich nation. He said if the two sides work together, they can create synergy, given the UAE's potential to produce blue hydrogen, which is derived from natural gas, and South Korea's ability to utilize it. Green fuel and blue fuel's production are the key points of the UAE, and the fuel and fuel cell. 연료전지, 액화 운송 등 수소의 활용과 저장, 유통의 강점을 가진 한국이 서로 협력하면 양국은 수소 경제를 선도하게 될 것입니다. In fact, the UAE is the first partnership with South Korea has to import hydrogen produced overseas. The UAE is taking proactive measures to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, a goal shared by South Korea. President Moon's trip to the UAE is largely focused on gaining a stronger foothold in promising industries such as hydrogen energy and defense in the Middle East region. On Monday, Moon will deliver a keynote speech on carbon neutrality and clean energy at the opening ceremony of the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News, Dubai. On the local front, grocery shopping has become a costly affair ahead of the Lunar New Year celebration and amid the prolonged pandemic. Eun Jin explains. It's taking longer for grocery shoppers to fill their shopping carts as they notice increases in the prices of goods. If it were any other time, they would put the items back on the shelf. But that's not the case ahead of the Lunar New Year ceremonies. According to a survey by the Korea National Council of Consumer Organizations, the prices of essential items like cooking oil and flour have spiked by more than 18 percent and exponentially for essential foods for ancestral rituals like pork and yellow corvina. Daily items like toothpaste, shampoo and detergent are roughly 10 percent more expensive. And with a rise in prices of coffee beans, even instant coffee has seen an average price increase of 7.3 percent. Starbucks changed its price list for the first time in eight years to reflect increased prices as other similar franchises follow suit. The prolonged COVID-19 pandemic is behind the failure of global supply to keep up with consumption recovery, which led to last year's prices increases on imported goods to hit a 13-year record high since the 2008 financial crisis. The industry explained that they could no longer hold out on pressure to raise prices, but for average people who may have already seen their livelihoods hit with reduced income, their price increases are bound to be harsher. The government expanded stockpiles of agricultural and marine products before the Lunar New Year and also raised the benchmark interest rate to pre-pandemic levels, but it is difficult to get a sense of when consumer price growth will begin to fall from recent levels. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Neighboring China is looking ahead to a modest economic performance this year, having ended the final quarter of last year with a slightly better than expected economic report card. Our Kim Sung-min has details. China's economy saw a weak finish to 2021, extending its slowdown in the final quarter. According to China's National Bureau of Statistics on Monday, the country's economic growth in the fourth quarter of last year further slowed to 4 percent. That follows the slowdown in the previous two quarters, giving the country an annual GDP growth of 8.1 percent, mainly from the huge growth in the first quarter, which came due to the base effect. That annual figure was still above the modest goal of above 6 percent previously set by the Chinese government. The seemingly disappointing Q4 figure, however, was higher than the market expectations, which were below 4 percent. Bloomberg had forecast China's Q4 GDP to grow 3.5 percent and 8 percent for 2021. The slowdown was widely expected as the country struggled with both internal and external headwinds. Experts say the Chinese economy was dragged down by a weaker property market and a fallout from the Evergreen crisis as Beijing tightened its grip on debt in the property sector. Strict COVID-19 measures, surging prices of raw materials and global supply bottlenecks also put a strain on China's growth engine. And the grim outlook for the country continues into the new year.
Citing the property market slowdown as the biggest threat in the near term, U.S. investment bank J.P. Morgan earlier projected the country's economy will grow 4.9% in 2022. Goldman Sachs revised down its 2022 growth forecast to 4.3% based on the ongoing pandemic. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. Right, it is Monday, the start of a new week, and time for yet another segment of Biz Now. I have G. Abili, editor at the Korea Economic Daily Global Edition, here in the studio. Welcome, G. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, so what do you have for us today? In the previous segments, we talked about how the Korean IPO market has heated up in 2021, and that trend is continuing into this new year. So last week, the world's number two battery maker, LG Energy Solution, has attracted bids worth around 80 billion US dollars from institutional investors. The bullish sentiment raised hopes for the listing's box office success. LG Energy's market capitalization is expected to reach 100 billion, trillion one rather, or 84.3 billion dollars. Not surprisingly, the IPO news also pushed up stocks of its parent LG Chem and competitors like SK Innovation and Samsung SDI. Foreigners and local institutional investors snapped up LG Chem and SK Innovation to manage risks of inability to buy enough LG Energy shares on the Cosby debut scheduled for January 27th, 10 days from now. Right, so how are investors here in elsewhere preparing for this debut? Well, only about 10% of LG Energy shares are expected to be available for trade after the listing, and 60% of the investors who participated in the institutional uh, subscription have already agreed to a lockdown clause. Now that means those investors promise not to sell the stocks at, until a certain point of time after the IPO. Right, I see. Now let's turn to a different type of investment, G. Tell us about a Korean startup that has received funding from a global VC giant. That's right. So SoftBank Group is investing $146 million in South Korea's artificial intelligence startup, Craft Technologies. Industry insiders say the fresh injection of funds will be used to accelerate Craft's ongoing expansion into the U.S. and China. The two parties will also work on developing AI-enabled portfolio management systems for SoftBank. Kraft develops and operates deep learning-based algorithms that provide portfolio analysis to financial institutions. Right, so gee, what does this mean in actual detail? So using artificial intelligence, Kraft tracks 50 blue chip stocks in the U.S. and analyzes their return on investment. In addition to the quantitative analysis, the program also tracks the impact of currency exchange rate and industry news. Since 2019, it has listed six ETFs on the New York Stock Exchange, with all of them boasting strong performances. The AI startup received the initial investment from Delta Investment, Shinan Bank and KB Investment. In May last year, it received 15 billion won or nearly 13 million US dollars from Korea Development Bank, Dunamu & Partners and Smilegate Investment. At the time of the investment, Kraft's corporate value was priced at 175 billion won but industry insiders say that would have doubled by now. Doubled, wow. Not a shabby investment right. at all. Uh, gee, we have time for one more story, I understand. You're going to be That's talking right. about uh, POSCO, is it? That's exactly right. So the world's sixth largest deal maker re reported record earnings last year. The company's operating profit nearly quadrupled to 9.2 trillion won or $7.7 .7 billion on a consolidated basis in 2021. That's the largest amount since 1968 when the company was founded. Sales also surged more than 32% to an all-time high of 76.4 trillion won. South Korea's top steelmaker has been recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic-caused economic slowdown since the first quarter of 2021, posting quarterly operating profits of more than 1 trillion won. POSCO dealt with rising prices of raw materials such as iron ore and coal by raising product prices to improve profitability. That's all for me today. All right, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. Glad to be here.
In today's studio session, we delve into efforts aimed at limiting the potential impact of an Omicron onslaught on the local front amid the distribution of COVID-19 treatment pills. For more, I have Professor Yu Byung-wook from Sun Cheng University. Professor Yu, it's a pleasure to see you again. I also have Dr. Kim Sing Tech at Institute Pasture Korea joining us live on the line. Dr. Kim, it's a pleasure to see you. Good afternoon. Right, Professor Yu, let's start here. The decline in our daily COVID-19 tally appears to be slowing down. Do you believe Omicron is to blame? Well, until next last Saturday, it seems to be slope was slowing down. But yesterday and probably today and tomorrow, they will show you the kind of different phase of the COVID-19 situation. Because usually weekdays and weekends, they are different because the number of COVID-19 tests cases is different. But it's slowed down very slowly in the yesterday and probably tomorrow. So, which means COVID-19 situations, so still Korean government will depend against the Omicron well, because the outbounding patient will control it. But unknown spread in domestics, we don't know exactly how much is spreading in Korean peninsula. So I believe it seems to be very stable to go this week, but from the next week can be a slightly going higher again, because what you mentioned depend on Omicron spreading in Korean Peninsula. I see. Meanwhile, Dr. Kim, last Friday, as my colleague Yun Seng mentioned earlier, nine COVID-19 patients receiving care at home here in the country received Paxlovid. Now, on the priority list are those aged 65 and above, as well as those with weak immune systems. What more can you tell us about those who are eligible for the antiviral pills, Dr. Kim? Well, first of all, uh, the reason for we actually set the uh, some priority list is that the supply is not enough. I mean, this is not just a, a pro just not just a problem in Korea, but for other just the countries as well. So every country is uh, trying to get as much as just uh, the this uh, the drug as possible. So the uh, the some uh, uh, kind of just a priority list is that the people with high risk factors, including the elderly people, and then also people with the underlying medical condition. And one of the underlying medical condition actually includes uh, some weak, just, uh, Im just the people with a very weak immunity. And that those people include the, uh, the people who experience the uh, some organ transplant. And therefore, this, uh, the patient actually just uh, takes uh, some uh, immunosuppressive just the uh, drug because in order to just uh, prevent any rejection of the uh, transplanted organ from the body. Another uh, group of people is uh, some people actually just uh, taking uh, anti-cancer treatment and also people with the, uh, some uh, autoimmune diseases. And uh, well, this, uh, this is kind of just uh, underlying uh, conditions uh, for uh, underlying conditions for with the, some high risk factors for this COVID-19. And then there are some also concerns, maybe some uh, some uh, the people who actually have to just avoid the, uh, some Paxlovid. And then the most uh, uh, representative thing is the, uh, of the uh, some Paxlovid side effect is the, some liver damage that's actually caused by the uh, ritonavir, which is actually one of the uh, the drug of the uh, Paxlovid. And then this uh, ritonavir actually is known for well, this has been used for, uh, since the uh, 1990s. Uh, as, uh, this is drug also is just uh, one of the, uh, the, the drug uh, component of the uh, some aged age just uh, uh, for the drug for the aged patient. So the, in terms of any some uh, the features and the safety profiles of ritonavir is uh, pretty well known. So I think just a five day course of this uh, drug. This is, this is not for just a chronic disease, and then it probably most, for most people would be okay. Right, and Dr. Kim, staying with, staying on the treatment front, that is, remdesivir, which has been used to treat severe illness, will be administered to those in hospital for moderate symptoms, I understand. What are your thoughts on this? Well, the uh, initial just uh, uh, clinical trial was actually con uh, for the remdesivir as actually conducted for some hospital hospitalized patients. One of the reasons is that the uh, this remdesivir is not, this is not just an oral drug, and this is an uh, uh, intravenous drug, so this has to be administered by the uh, sort of just injection. So the, uh, the initial the set of just uh, all the participants of the, the, uh, the drug uh, clinical trial was uh, just hospitalized the, the patients. But now the, uh, this remdesivir is uh, basically, uh, this is antiviral drug. It's like a molupiravir and the Paxlovid. The mechanism of this drug is actually just uh, uh, inhibiting just the uh, virus replication. And also especially just, uh, just in terms of uh, just mechanism of action, uh, this is very similar to the uh, molupiravir. But the uh, major difference compared to molupiravir, this is injection drug, and then the molupiravir is uh, just an oral drug. 
So uh, uh, initially, this uh, the drug was actually approved for the hospitalized patient, and then the mostly for the severe just COVID-19, and then actually taken mostly just uh, five days in the hospital. But the last year, the Pfizer actually uh, tried the phase three clinical trial of the uh, this uh, remdesivir for just uh, the mild and the moderate just COVID-19 patients. And then the outcome from the uh, the Pfizer is that. Uh, Actually, uh, for this phase three clinical trial, a total of 562 just the people, uh, COVID-19 patients actually participate in this clinical trial. And then the result was that in terms of uh, just uh, end, primary endpoint of uh, hospitalization and death, actually 87% of efficacy is, is actually just a blocking of progression to the uh, some hospitalization and death. And that this efficacy is very similar to what actually we observed for the Paxlovid uh, phase three clinical trials. And if we set down the uh, some uh, uh, endpoint as a uh, medical disease due to COVID-19 also death, even just the efficacy is the 81%. So, I mean, in terms of efficacy, this is just pretty good. And uh, I think uh, uh, the one of the reasons actually uh, our government is considering remdesivir for mild and uh, moderate COVID-19 is that uh, while the uh, some monoclonal antibody, especially uh, while the uh, some uh, the monoclonal antibodies from Celtrion and others, including red, uh, uh, red Regeneron and uh, Eli Lilly, actually their uh, neutralizing uh, neutralization capacity was uh, sharply actually dropped against the, the Omicron variant. So we need uh, some other, some alternatives actually deal with the, uh, some this Omicron variant. But anyway, now we have uh, just the uh, Paxlovid and then Molipravir. Although this is uh, uh, the injection drug, maybe Remdesivir would be a very just a uh, big surplus. And uh, well, in addition, I wanna say that uh, uh, Gilead Science also developing the uh, Remdesivir as a oral pill, not I just see. the injection drug. So. If this is a uh, well successful, this would be a, just a one big plus for our just uh, uh, the capacity to deal with the uh, some COVID nineteen pandemic. Right, it would also be really convenient, of course. Sure, of Professor course. Yu, starting on this Monday, COVID nineteen prevention measures here in the country have been extended for three more weeks, but the cap on social gatherings has been eased to pave the path for six people to gather socially. Are these current guidelines, you suppose, enough to offset or keep Omicron at bay? Well, someone probably are disappointed. Someone are uh, say the welcomes. Only the little change from the less than five persons and now less than seven persons. But anyway, so the Omicron variants, as I mentioned from the beginning, now is the border, borderline control is the first line defense. The people who should be uh, 10 days for vaccinated or not should be the quarantine. So most of cases, more than 80% would on, under the borderline control and the quarantines, we found an Omicron. But Omicron will be dominant variant in Korean Peninsula soon. So which means these the three weeks, the social distance measures help to save the time to prepare the big hit and the new wave. It will be another crisis. So cannot be prevented 100% of the Omicron crisis in Korea but probably we have time to handle it to preparing to the real big hit. I see, and staying with Omicron, following its alarming spread in Europe and the US, Omicron is now making its presence felt here in Asia. For more on that, I have Melbourne Reyes, the head of the Philippine Nurses Association, live on the line. It's a pleasure to have you back, Mr. Reyes. Uh, uh, good day, uh, Sunny. Thank you for having me here again. Right. COVID-19 infections in the Philippines has been hitting well above 35,000 cases a day over, over there, of course, in recent days. Could we start with a bit more about the COVID-19 situation in the Philippines, Mr. Reyes? Well, the resurgence of COVID-19 cases came after the national government is all restriction to increase the consumption of the, Philipp the people during the holiday season uh, as a solution to revive businesses and profits after recording series of very low, uh, very low case last December. As of yesterday, about 37,154 new cases were recorded. And what is very alarming, it includes health workers now despite being vaccinated. I see. So there are breakthrough infections there. Mr. Reyes, the Philippines is still reeling from the aftermath of last month's Typhoon Rai. Having said that, how are authorities there seeking to contain the resurgence in COVID-19 infections while supporting Typhoon relief efforts? Yeah, as estimated, the 16 million people in six of the country's 17 regions are affected by Super Typhoon Rai.
uh, leaving 2.4 million most vulnerable people in need of assistance. Uh, needs are tremendous shelter, uh, food, water, clothing, me medicines, etc. But the, the country is recovering through responses of the humanitarian community partners in support of the government local response and relief efforts. No, uh, it is uh, um, it's, it is somehow no. Uh, uh, it uh, it would uh, might affect no the situation might affect the spread of COVID-19 because of uh, um, the of these circumstances to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus. Days before the coming of the super typhoon and post typhoon contingency plans have been done by the government through the local government units and other agencies and task force to manage evacuations of residents and families in order to observe health safety protocols, specifically the wearing of masks and observe physical distancing at the evac evacuation centers. I see. Also, as part of efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19, I hear Mr. Reyes, the unvaccinated have been banned from public transportation. What has been the public response to this measure? The Philippine government banned the unvaccinated individuals from public transport following President Rodrigo Duterte's order to restrict the people's movement as COVID-19 infection surges. The ban will cause more problem and it does not address the root reason no, why many are not getting vaccinated, which is access to vaccination at this time. Various reactions came from different sectors. To some, the policy of no vac vaccination, no right in Metro Manila perceived as explicit coercion of the masses and outright violation of the right to mobility. Others challenged the government to accelerate and expand the vaccination drive by providing incentives for hesitant Filipinos to get vaccinated to some. It is meant to avoid complete transport shut shutdown if more public transport personnel test positive for COVID-19. I see. Last August, Mr. Reyes, you were on our show to share with us the challenges faced by health workers there on the front lines of the pandemic. What has been the impact of the latest rebound in cases on the medical arena in the Philippines? Well, the current healthcare system in the Philippines is still struggling to cope with the challenges and impact of the resurgence of COVID-19 cases, especially lack of manpower, so as not to overwhelm hospitals and healthcare workers who many had been sick or infected with the corona coronavirus. The Department of Health recently issued latest policies and guidelines on quarantine and isolation. The changes in policy came after uh, the DOH allowed hospitals to implement shortened quarantine and isolation for fully vaccinated healthcare workers to address the lack of manpower as COVID-19 cases reached unprecedented highs this month. The health experts in the country believe that shortening quarantine outweighs the risk, especially for this Omicron variant. I see. All right. Again, a very big thank you to you and your colleagues, Mr. Reyes, for your selfless dedication to fighting COVID-19 and for your time and thoughts today. Thank you, Sammy. Right, back here then on the local front, Dr. Kim, authorities have spoken about adopting a new level of response should our daily tally hit above 7,000. Now, why is this threshold important? Well, I think the, uh, the government actually considers the, uh, our just the healthcare just capacity to actually just uh, deal with the, uh, some, uh, this, especially just the Omicron variant. I think uh, the Omicron variant uh, will soon be uh, some predominant just a variant, uh, even in our just country as well. So the Omicron variant, now just people somehow, now just uh, kind of just consensus is that this is uh, more contagious. It's like uh, spread very well compared to other, the previous variants, like uh, two to three fold more faster. And also, although the, the issue generally is uh, some mild, just in terms compared to yes, about the previous uh, sort of variant. So uh, basically, this is uh, just to consider our just the capacity and also just to buy some time. I mean, this is uh, the very fast just uh, uh, spreading the virus. So if we just uh, uh, just uh, uh, well, the number of just uh, uh, total just to confirmed the COVID-19 is now seven thousand. It could just uh, quickly become the uh, the ten thousand, even just uh, even more just uh, just uh, the ten thousand, the twenty or the, the thirty just uh, thirty thousand. So this is basically to buy some time and then just consider our just healthcare systems. Right, I see. Professor Yu, once our daily tally surpasses the seven thousand mark, apparently our testing method will include the rapid antigen tests as well. What are your thoughts on using these rapid antigen tests? Fortunately, Korean government, we have a capacity to daily weekdays base at least 450,000 
PCR we can do maximum is three seven hundred thousand we can so which means we have still have a good capacity but if Omicron's attack to Korean Korean Peninsula is like uh, US and the Europe probably the shortage can be happen why because the many medical professional can be isolated or be the treated because Omicron itself so shortage of the hands can do perform of the PCR test but problem is first negatives who are COVID-19 Omicron cases but rapid antigen test cannot catch it it can be make the other issues so still insist keep on the PCR test as standard but if we have any emergency cases crisis real case crisis in medical delivery system and diagnosis system detective collapse that time we should be prepared for kind of alternative but still we are using standards as the PCR as the standard should be right and staying with testing dr. Kim some researchers claim a throat swab may be more effective at detecting Omicron than a nasal swab what are your thoughts well uh, there are uh well, depending on the, uh, the different type of diagnostics, so some people say the, the throat stop is uh, much accurate than the, uh, the, 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 the those drugs. And then I think uh, some uh, experts even just argued that the, uh, some, uh, even the, from the dose, the, the people we are actually detecting more like uh, some live, it's not really the technically sound, the correct term, but live virus uh, from the, uh, the, the, the actually dead virus. But from the throat, we are actually detecting uh, some more like uh, some live virus. And I think about uh, even just before we distinguish the uh, some dose and the mouse, just to, just for uh, taking the, uh, the samples, there are some uh, complicating factors. In the case of nose, I mean, some countries are actually is recommending just blowing just a nose before just starting, just before actually just taking samples out of the nose because uh, some the contaminants actually just might just disturb the uh, just the readings of the uh, all the PCR test, and also from the mouse. Some actually some residue or just food in our mouth can actually just compromise the result of just a, even just RT PCR result or like a rapid antigen test result. So maybe just blowing those and the mouth washing is one of just the recommendation for just prior to the, the, the taking the samples for just this uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 test. And uh, in terms of uh, maybe the sensitivity, I think uh, obviously just the PCR method is uh, superior than the other method. But sometimes, uh, depending on the uh, some uh, different just uh, rapid antigen test, some people just argue that uh, maybe infectivity in terms of infectivity, rapid antigen test might be just an alternative to uh, some uh, PCR test as well. Right. Professor, you also under a 7,000 daily tally scenario. Clinics within neighborhoods will be asked to treat COVID-19 patients. This was something my colleague Soa mentioned earlier. Now, there are concerns about this particular plan. What can be done to ease such concerns? If we are open the, the chance to attend the COVID patient from the primary care systems, probably there are more people can be con contaminated and contagious condition. But we have the experience, it was 2009. Yes, we have an H1N1 influenza crisis. That time, primary care, secondary delivery, tertiary level of hospital, yeah, we attend patients. But we don't claiming about it. We not to worry about it because we knew influenza somehow. But COVID-19 is very new and unknown virus. But now we are knowing a bit than before, but still we don't know. That's why we worry about it. So how we can preparing this condition? First, should we prepare the COVID-19 oral pill first? Can be treated immediately. Second, now time to discuss change of the idea and consensus about COVID-19. No more level D protection like astronaut medical professional. And we are going to have the COVID-19 Omicron variant or other further is look change like the endemic in like influenza. That time, we can easy to accept to go to small clinic to see the, our hometown doctor. But same idea like these days, probably no one go there because we are scaring still. We don't want to go because we are dying from COVID-19. We believe that. Right. Dr. Kim, in response to the legal dispute if a vaccine passes, authorities have decided to lift their requirement at a number of venues, including movie theatres, museums and large retail stores. What are your thoughts on this? 
Well, there were actually just opinions uh, were actually sharply just uh, divided on the, especially for the uh, the vaccine pass. And I think the uh, just uh, right just uh, the sort of the decision that this morning actually replied just reflected the uh, some current status of the COVID-19 in Korea and also resolved the uh, some uh, conflict regarding the uh, the recent just uh, two just uh, bad countries things just a uh, court the judgment. Well, I think uh, but uh, there is no I mean 100 percent just a correct answer for uh, this. Uh, this kind of a just very hot issue because uh, depending on the which kind of which factors we are actually prioritize, the answers might be very different. But anyway, just uh, regard well regardless of just answers, I think uh, all the uh, experts and uh, uh, our authorities actually just uh, uh, consider the. Uh, I think uh, in large the uh, three different just uh, the factors. So for first is uh, we still the long term just the projection is uh, uh, just uh, living with COVID-19, and then now we have uh, in addition to the quarantine and the social distance measures, we have now just two more just the uh, weapons. I mean the vaccination, also just the uh, drugs, or especially just oral drugs, and then uh, we are also just considering the. Uh, the burdens and the capacity 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 of our healthcare system, and uh, this this is actually not just a big just a change. I mean, the, even just uh, uh, compared to the uh, the prior to the Omicron the variant, but now just uh, one of the big just a variable that we have to just uh, uh, the, the consider is now just the Omicron variant. So the all those things now we are actually uh, the take into consideration and the kind of just a compromise, and then the how what kind of the factors we are actually just weighing more. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, that that's this is actually a very tough, tough decision. I think, but we are still just very on the right track, on the right, right track on the uh, some uh, the dealing with the, uh, the the current situation. Right. All right, Dr. Kim. As always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts, Professor. You here in the studio. Thank you for being with us today. Right, as mentioned earlier, starting on this Monday, a total of six people can gather socially nationwide at drinking and dining establishments, which can cater to patrons until nine in the evening. Do take care. Thank you for watching. When the lantern of wisdom and mercy lights up, a traditional cultural festival.